And there is genuine unease in Europe that our standards of hygiene may soon spread south, and that concepts such as a weekly bath night or the sniffing of socks before putting them on may begin to erode the foundations of continental chic. And the fears do not end there. The biggest single obstacle to a united and harmonious Europe is British food. We are the nation that gave the world pork scratchings, and it's difficult to argue a case for a snack that has hair growing out of it. In recent years, the revolution and design of food in our supermarkets has helped spread the belief that we've become more sophisticated in our eating habits. But deep down, the British are still a nation who like to eat cold steak and kidney pies out of the cellophane. Recent research suggests that every man, woman and child in Britain eats 37.4 pizzas each year. But have you seen them? They're not like Italian pizzas, which, somewhat controversially, are made with fresh ingredients like buffalo mozzarella. We make them with processed cheddar, then sling on plastic boiled ham and tinned sweet corn to make them more exotic. Tropical pizzas covered with tinned pineapple chunks are a national favourite. And rapidly gaining ground is the spicy Eastern pizza, oozing with chicken tikka masala. It's only a matter of time before we heap them with beef vindaloo and sweet and sour spare ribs, probably simultaneously. I, I come here and I look at some dishes with everybody thinks are Italians, and to me they don't look like the real thing because nobody's actually used the right ingredients. So pizza, it's very fresh, crunchy bread dough, rolled out really nice and thin with a minimum amount of toppings so that when you eat it you can really still taste the bread dough and a little bit of the yeast. You can still taste the tomato and it should be a fresh tomato on the top. The mozzarella, the oregano, the oil, the parsley, the basil, whatever you're going to put on top, but always very few ingredients. Have you ever considered serving a sausage and brown ale gravy pizza? Mm. No, no, I like sausages, I like, you know, a nice bit of gravy with it, but I wouldn't put it on a pizza, it doesn't seem to be the right place. She won't get a job at Pizza Hut unless she bucks her ideas up. Hello. Uh, is it true that you do um, a, a sausage pizza with brown ale gravy? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think I'll have one, please. OK. Thanks very much. Thanks. Hi, medium pan with Roma. So instead of going after buying really wonderful pears and apples and wonderful local cheese, you want something to you can shove in the oven, you can shove in the microwave. It has to be hot. It has to be hot. Whether it's a soup and it's in the middle of summer, it has to be hot. Belgium people cook more. Like they spend time on their food and it's not quality, not just quantity. What I really hate is the English breakfast. I mean, it's okay to try it once, you know, just as an experiment. I have uh, had British food. I eat in the canteen in Imperial College and I've survived so far. <coughs> but <laughs> I want to say every day, I'm, I'm, I think I'm getting good at it now to pick out the things that haven't been boiled for half an hour and the things that haven't been mixed from the previous week. You don't know how to put things together in a meal, how to dress, beauty of uh, something. You don't know, for instance, how to put a wine with a specific food. You think that we are joking. And in a way, for us, it's a little bit cold and uh, dull. The big supermarket chains now say that the British have the greatest variety of foodstuffs in the world, that every week over 300 new items hit the high street shelves, and they may well be right, but have you seen them? Mushy pea fritters. Frozen oven chips that have tomato ketchup on the inside. What fiend dreamed that one up? And what's wrong with our bakers? Why can't they make proper cakes? These are the lager louts of the confectionery world. Continental patisseries with their hand-baked brioche and tarte aux pommes and orgasmic confectioner's custard can't hold a candle to Mr Bun the Baker's day-glow horrors, pebble-dashed with glacé cherries and stone-clad with chocolate flakes. Displays of iced buns seem to have festered untouched since Jubilee Day. Egg custards hang around for weeks like a bad smell. Our most popular lines, boxed and standardised, have the sensual appeal of an industrial estate. And then there is the problem of British quiche. In Strasbourg, Milan or Rome, quiche melts in the mouth. 
but the knobbly bit of bone that lurks in the middle of cheap bacon is an essential ingredient of British quiche. Nothing can match the moment when half a pig's kneecap embeds itself in your molar. Vegetable. Crisp, nutritious, life-giving. But we don't have vegetables. We have veg. Veg is a sloppy word, a mushy word. But actually, it's a very onomatopoeic word. A perfect word to describe what's left of a vegetable after it's been through a British kitchen. Because we like to boil that cabbage to death. Then give it another 20 minutes just to be on the safe side. Otherwise, you wouldn't get that nice reassuring wet splat when it hits your plate and covers the rest of your food with three quarters of an inch of lukewarm lime green water. That's veg. There was a Frenchman on Radio 4 recently, something which in itself was probably enough to convince many listeners that we were on a course of irreversible national decline. He was talking about a subject that's a source of unbridled merriment to many Europeans, our political sex scandals. In his opinion, members of the government are prone to dressing up in fishnets and football shirts, poor, fair, rumpy, pumpy, avec their gorgeous, pouting research assistants, because, due to the classic British combination of private education and pug ugliness, they've never actually had much sex. Throughout Europe, there is a feeling that the British and sex go together like the Italians and income tax. I was told by my friends, Etonians, that they're all potential homosexuals. Not even physically, but they're homose potential homosexuals because all they know really well and all they understand is men. You go somewhere as a woman with a, with a man next to you. People talk to the man and the woman doesn't exist. Transparent, absolutely transparent. So a glass, say, um, I'm here, hello. Oh, uh, yes, I'm sorry. You have two attitudes. Either it's really very vulgar, it's the kind of page three girls, if you like. It's really the kind of thing you had in the 60s, is sex, sex, sex everywhere, which is extremely crude for, her, for us. Or you have the very romantic attitude, passion, flowers, and, and shyness. And in between, I think you have nothing. Mm, I mean, I've never really liked any English guys because they never smile, they never Why laugh. They, they're always with a stiff upper lip. You, you say a joke and they're like, ha, ha. I mean, they don't laugh with their hearts. They don't know how to. The British do not know intimacy. It's fancy. Intimacy, where people really open up to each other, where everybody knows, not everyone, where people know what, what really goes on in them. I went to a man who had a wonderful tie, silk tie, and I went to him at a party, and I said, oh, what a lovely tie you have, and I wanted to touch it. Oh, he was frightened. I was ripping him, and he was in France, in Italy, in, it's so normal. We, we touch each other. We are the only country to speak of having sex rather than making love. Having sex is a bit like delivering coal or peeling spuds. We're also the only European language to use the act of lovemaking as a swear word. Anyone would think we didn't like it. Although we're knee-deep in sleaze, there is a widespread belief abroad that the English don't actually do it at all, except when it happens between consenting males in a House of Commons committee room while brandishing a riding crop and fantasising about matron. But if we don't like it, aren't good at it, and don't in fact do it, how come we need so many repressive rules about children? I think that English parents sometimes try to hide their emotions from their children, and I don't think that's right. Kids have to go away from home very early, and, you know, I had friends who had to pay rent to their own parents <laughs> because they were staying in their flats and things like that. Children are always wanting to have to be put away somewhere, like if you go to pubs, there's a special children's room where they stay outside in the garden. Many of the hotels listed in our upmarket guidebooks specify no children. In the rest of Europe, it's illegal to ban children from anywhere, so foreigners are astonished to see them being refused entrance to a hotel or restaurant or pub. And isn't it an edifying spectacle going to the European courts to fight for the right to hit them? Oi, back here and behave. 
Not so long ago, the English used to lock people up in our great medieval fortresses for being French. So it's no surprise that the French language contains many expressions which involve us. Crème anglaise, which is custard. Les redingotes d'Angleterre, which are condoms. Le vice anglais, homosexuality and flagellation, but not necessarily in that order. And les anglais débarquent, which means that a woman's period has started. All meant in good-natured fun, of course, and taken in the same way. Then there are those expressions which don't involve us, but which are about us, such as sang froid, cold blood. Thirty years ago, most of these people would have been wearing bowler hats, but little else has changed. Our neighbours believe that we are still over-formal, stiff, rigid, lacking in joy, spontaneity or existential glee. There's certainly a terrifying lack of beauty in the way we live our everyday lives, and as a nation, we do not seem very happy. Is it just our climate, or does the chill penetrate our souls? People abroad say the English are cold. That's the word they use. Froid, cold, fredo. You know, they're cold. They're nice, but cold. People can't open themselves. They're so cramped inside themselves. So by saying something they really mean or they really think, they will feel undressed. So they just cover themselves with words or with things. They just, they don't want people to know who they are. Because for us and for, say, continental people, it's so normal to express, you know, to be extrovert. So that kind of, uh, you know, hiding, being cool, stiff, stiff upper lip and so on, Mm, there's something a little bit fishy behind, you know, they are hypocr hypocrites. There are lots of people who had very cold relationships with their parents, so obviously, you know, in all their other human relationships, they find it very difficult to express emotions and, uh, you know, just be themselves. In France or Italy, if the men fancy a night out of a weekend, then they seek out the women or even their families, whereas in Britain, Gangs of emotionally stunted blokes roam the streets in search of a laugh. And now, of course, they're roaming the streets and beaches of Europe too, loud, proud, and drawing attention to themselves, as if to say, that's right, it's us, the lads. Bad food, terrible lovers, and we're all pissed. What a laugh, eh? Oh, look, Colin's passed out. Let's shave his eyebrows off. Don't you like us? Yeah. I'll take that as a no. <laughs> of course, the tunnel isn't the cause of all this, but it does have great symbolic importance. It represents our national talent for taking a very long time to decide something, then upsetting everyone anyway. It also stands for our apathy and our lack of a grand vision. While the French talk of a magnificent gesture, we speak of a cost-effective business, as if it were a hospital or a school. Apparently, there'll be no customs at the other end of the tunnel. French officers will be over here on English soil with dogs and guns, which seems a pity when there are so many people in southeast England who could have provided their own and done the job for less. Amiel and Lille actually competed for the rail link, whereas here, in the Garden of England, the whole project seems about as popular as a tunnel linking us with France. And how ironic that the destiny of the tunnel should fall to a government that is anti-European, anti-rail and anti-upsetting its supporters in the home counties. If there'd been a reason for whacking the rail link through Merseyside or Scotland, the shovels would have been a blur years ago. Until now, we've been cut off by the sea, safe in the knowledge that this is still the greatest country in the world. Statistically and emotionally, Europe's biggest appeal for the British remains the duty-free. We developed in weird and separate ways, the pot-bellied bulldogs of Europe. It used to require a bit of effort to get a ferry or catch a flight, but now, blimey, you can drive there. Come on, what are we waiting for? Let's get our retaliation in first. Is a great ball a great ball? Find out after the break.
Vauxhall Corsa. Please remember, it's only a car. Golden Delicious. The more delicious golden. Just picked, just perfect. So, just pick Cape. American Airlines, serving more than 200 cities throughout the USA, now gives you more of America, with new non-stops from London to Philadelphia, Nashville, Tennessee, and Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Now, American offers more than 100 flights each week from London to the USA, all on American Airlines. New Unifilla from Unibond. Its added adhesive means when it goes in, it stays in. New Unifilla. It won't let you down. Jet 520 and 560C printers from Hewlett Packard. For all the people you have to be in business. Mr. Johnson to see you. Hello. Welcome to Kenko. Take a seat. I'll make this short. I'm sure we're both very busy. Can I get you a coffee, Mr. Johnson? Do you have decaf? I'll have a look. Right, I'll uh, come straight to the point. Coffee. Thank you. <clears throat> So you didn't have decaf then? No, I didn't. But you did. Kenko decaffeinated. Everything we know about coffee in a decaf. This Easter, hop along to Safeway for six delicious Safeway white hot cross buns. Just 59p. Safeway, where good value comes naturally. number one ferry company. I give you a toast, ladies and gentlemen. I give you a toast, ladies and gentlemen. And we love so well In dignity and freedom dwell The worlds may change and go awry While there is still one voice to cry there Well, it's done now After years of dreaming Numerous false starts All scuffered by the English Perfidious Albion